praise the wonderful name of Jesus. Certainly, we're delighted to have all of you tuning in with us as we continue in our wonderful study on women of the Old Testament. As you know, this is not an exhaustive study. We will not be covering every woman of the Old Testament, but we're we are studying several key women in the Old Testament. And so we're delightful that you have been studying with us, and certainly as we open this for Women's History Month here in the month of March. As you know, we're going to continue in this study uh, through the month of April and into May. So thank you for coming on this journey with us. Won't you join us with a word of prayer? Ever righteous God, our Father, we thank you for women of the Bible, Old Testament. We thank you for the Rose Visual Bible Study series that has just been allowing us to grow in your word. We pray on tonight that your spirit and your our wonderful anointing flow, that you just open our eyes and give us spiritual insight and give us spiritual understanding that we might know what it is that thou hast for us. We ask you all of these blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so we're going to break down each uh, lesson into two segments, except for one. Uh, we're going to uh, be covering through this information. And so we started on last week with uh, our Lesson 1A. And so this week we are in Lesson uh, 1B, which comes to us from the 11th uh, page of our wonderful book from the Rose Visual Bible Study Series. And this particular one, Old uh, Testament, Women in the Old Testament. And so we are looking at Rebecca, and we are seeing what it is that uh, Rebecca has to help us with and to understand how things were in her time and understand how that can relate to us in our time. And so uh, we want to look at the culture. So we're looking at explore it and we're going to analyze the culture. Uh, ancient societies were organized around a patriarchal structure and, and that really meant that uh, you got your definition as to who you are and your family relationship based on the eldest male heir. Uh, so this person uh, was the one in charge. They made decisions. They were the one that received the choice part of the money uh, from the family and the family's wealth. Uh, but not only do we see that the identity of the family is established by uh, the father, but we also see that it was also a patrilocal society, uh, which basically means that uh, whenever two families join together by having a son marry a daughter, uh, the daughter would then relocate to the house of the, the husband and, and basically be in as a part of that man's extended family in the extended household. So whereas you had the senior father who was uh, the commander, the captain, uh, the leader, the, the patriarch of the family, and now someone is joining into the family, the woman would go to the man's extended family, not the other way around. And so we see uh, this as exemplified even with in Rebecca's story. Uh, for Rebecca, the patriarch of the family, was Abraham. Abraham was the head of the household. Abraham, as we know, had uh, two sons uh, in particular, all right, and Isaac uh, was the favored son to receive the inheritance of Abraham. Uh, being the favored son, uh, a Isaac would uh, be wed a wife, and the wife would join into Abraham's already established household where Abraham is the patriarch until Abraham passes, and then the patriarchal succession becomes Isaac, his son. Re Rebecca, uh, glory be to God, uh, Rebecca comes from uh, of a family that comes from the area where Abraham is from. Now, now, Isaac is not just the inheritance of a, a inheritor of Abraham's 
uh, blessings in terms of Abraham's finances, Abraham's household, Abraham's wealth, but also in the actual blessing in the covenant that God has made with Abraham. If you remember in Genesis 12, God made a covenant with Abraham that out of Abraham would flow, well, the, all the nations of the world would be blessed. That God would prosper Abraham, that God would give him a land. This land we refer to as the promised land. And Abraham left Ur of the Chaldees. He left the Mesopotamian area that he had grown up in, where he was born, was accustomed to, and left and went to this far away distant land, the land of Canaan, where God promised him. Abraham did not go alone. Abraham took his wife Sarah and took his nephew Lot. Uh, Abraham and Sarah lived first in Mesopotamia, but now they were transposed over 500 miles away to what we would call now Canaan. There is where they lived, and, 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 and there is where the story unfolds in that Abraham now being old and watching Isaac as Isaac has grown up and Isaac is not yet married, that Isaac needs a wife. And so he dispatches his uh, chief servant in order to find a wife for Isaac. Isaac is to go to his homeland and there pick a bride uh, from among the inhabitants of where Abraham is from. Abraham does this because Abraham does not want his son to have a wife of the Canaanites. Does not want his son to have a wife of the inhabitants of the area, but instead have a wife from where Abraham is from. Rebecca's narrative uh, begins in this area where Abraham is from, uh, Mesopotamia. And, and we, we see that the Mesopotamian uh, society is set up patriarchally, just as we have observed with Abraham, whereby uh, Rebecca is subject to the eldest who uh, male who is uh, in charge, all right? Uh, Rebecca is, is, is very interesting uh, situations with her because Rebecca uh, clearly is someone who is of a strong will and a strong opinion. As the narrative unfolds, we begin to see the life of Rebecca. We get to see it from a different perspective. Normally, the Old Testament covers uh, political drama, the royal court military campaigns, civic issues, but when, when, and in those areas we see men and that the men are in authority and, and the women really don't have a voice in those arenas. We do not often uh, see inside the home, don't often see oh, how a woman's life is and how it's functioned, but through Rebecca we're able to see some of that, and it has been confirmed by archaeologists and anthropologists uh, that women's real influence uh, was in their communities, and they exert those influences. So they may not have went out to war, they may not have been in the royal court, but certainly they held sway in the family. And so males, yes, were the head of the household, and they provide the public face for the family, but women had an unseen network where they used to exert their influence and sustain the community. Uh, women shared work. Uh, they often cared for each other's families. Uh, they, they often, uh, you know, provided the medical treatment and the nurturing. They, they, they oftentimes also uh, worked on different things that they created that could be sold to bring in income, to bring in money, to take care of the family. And so a woman's uh, position in the ancient Near East world was an important one as well. And so we see this unfold for Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca has, uh, Rebecca's life actually has two far apart geographical locations, right? This is a place where she grew up, Mesopotamia. 
uh, which was a very fertile place. It was supplied with uh, water that allowed for a very uh, fertile area where crops uh, were able to uh, grow, where animals were able to be taken care of, all uh, right, because of the Tigris and the Euphrates River, uh, where the Mesopotamia actually sat right in the middle of. And, and, and so there, there you see fertile soil, you see green grass, you see uh, farmers able to produce bounty, you see herders able to amass great amount of livestock, healthy livestock, because of the, the grass, the ground, and the water. And, and all really we see the importance of water. And yet we look at the other location, which is where Abraham is, where Isaac is, where Rebecca is to come to, and we see Negev, and we see that is a more barren, hard place, all right, where there is not much water, about 12 inches of water fall a year. And so that causes the ground to be very hard and cause it and so when you want to actually plant and grow crop you have to dig beneath the the the, the surface uh, soil in order to get to a place where you can actually plant it's it's, it's rough land uh, that land is rough and so we see animals there that are used or raised uh, to provide food and these are the ones that can survive on a little bit of water. And so you would wonder why would anyone want to leave the Fertile Crescent, leave Mesopotamia, where there is fertile land to go to this harder place, more like a frontier uh, a lifestyle, a rugged lifestyle. But uh, nevertheless, Rebecca does. And, and, and we see that this is a dangerous place. It's not, you know, it's not an easy place. It's not for the faith of heart and so our story unfolds and, and we see that Rebecca chooses to leave the fertile area to go to Negev to meet her future husband so one of the things is we want to look at the timeline and the timeline is on page 13 and when we look at the timeline it's just for us to have an understanding of where all of our stories will take place as we're going through so we're going through in a chronological manner. And so we're beginning first with the patriarchs and the matriarchs, uh, which uh, we're particularly focusing on Isaac and Rebecca. All right, Isaac being Abraham and Sarah's son. Uh, Rebecca, of course, is the son, the daughter, I should say, of uh, Nahor's uh, son. All right, and so uh, we see that unfold and later on we're going to go down and study the five sisters and we're going to go further down and study uh, Deborah and Jael and then we're going to go further and look at the wise woman and we're going to conclude with the woman of Shunem all right and so you see the chronological order of what is actually occurring and and we're looking at long uh, stretches of time all right just for instance just between uh, the uh, Jacob son Joseph and Moses is 400 years so we're, we're talking about a large stretch of time Genesis 24 uh, provides the narratives for us and tells us that Abraham is now very aged all right remember Abraham and Isaac at an old age he was a hundred years old so for Isaac to now have grown up you know that Abraham is even more advanced in age. And so Abraham sends his trusted servant to Mesopotamia in order to accomplish this great task of selecting a wife for his son. Uh, so he wants him to do that from a, where he's accustomed to, uh, the, 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 the area where he came from. And so this is the journey. And so the Bible says that as he, the servant is going, the servant literally is praying for God to give him a sign as to what woman to choose. And so in his prayer, he asks God that whichever woman will offer him something to drink uh, from the well and will also offer his camel something to drink 
that should be the woman. And it seems kind of simple, but there's deeper to it. And so as he journeys, he stops by the well. And the well is actually a good place for him to stop by. Uh, we see that his son uh, Jacob will later on follow and stop by a well when looking for his own wife. We'll see that Moses also stopped by a well and also was able to get a wife as well because this was the perfect location in order for you to get a wife. Why? Because this was where the young unmarried women would be. Uh, they would be gathering water. They would be engaging conversation. This was just that central location. Uh, so, the, so the servant uh, was just following in what would be the custom and the tradition to be able to stop at the well, to kind of see what's going on, to hear what's going on. Who's available, all right? Who has not yet found the person or the person who they're looking for has not yet found them. It's all at the well. And so he stops by the well and he's waiting and he sees uh, this woman, Rebecca, coming. And uh, the first thing that strikes him about Rebecca is her beauty. And the Bible painstakingly uh, mentions the fact that she is beautiful. But he's not looking for just mere outward beauty. He's also looking for inward beauty. And so uh, he, he asks her for some water. And she offers him water to drink. And so she already now fulfills the first part of his prayer. And then she offers to also give the camels water. Now, understand this, that uh, the camels uh, can drink a lot of water. All right, uh, camels are definitely uh, are able to drink a lot of water because they would go great distances in the desert. And so by supplying themselves with water internally, they can go a long time through the desert without actually pausing to get drinks of water. And, and anyone who's seeing a stranger come into town uh, who in those days would be coming with camels would obviously know, especially if they came from a long journey, that their camels would be thirsty. And, and so camels could drink a lot of water and, and these water could be hundreds of pounds. And this woman is giving water to all 10 camels. This is not an easy task. Uh, each of them easily could drink a gallon of water. Uh, and so we're talking about over eight pounds at times 10. And, and so you see she, she, she's carrying a lot. She's dealing with a lot of water, but she's willing. She offers and she does this. And, and so this fulfills the second part of his prayer. And, and, and when you really examine this, uh, he was really asking for a woman who w would uh, be exhibiting what we call a superpower uh, of being able to manage and to do all of that work and to make sure all the camels uh, received water. And, and certainly this would be a rare woman because most of them would, you know, obviously offer someone something to drink. That's that that's customary. But to go beyond and to do the extra and go this extra mile, you know, actually speaks volumes of Rebecca's character and her generosity. And so uh, the, the servant's motivation for this unique request, we can just use our divine and sanctified imagination to, 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 the, to try to predict what it is. Uh, I, and I do believe that he's looking for a matriarch who's not afraid to work, a matriarch who is a, a, a person of hospitality and who goes above and beyond. And so uh, we also can look at Abraham and see that that same characteristic it was exhibited by Abraham. In Genesis 18, Abraham, seeing strangers, offered them water to drink and then enticed them to come back to his house and then provided them with the choicest meat and the best of uh, bread that was freshly baked as well as uh, washed their, had their feet washed. And so this is the Bedouin custom of the time. And so Abraham is hospitable and certainly would want for Isaac a woman who's also hospitable. 
uh, Rebecca enters the scene and she uh, is beautiful and she's unmarried and she is in no way a coward. Uh, she entertains, she takes care of, she ensures that everything is uh, is in its proper place and does everything correct according to the custom of the time. She's not shy in any way, shape, or manner. She takes care of the stranger, and the stranger realizes, the servant realizes, this is the wife. This is the one that Isaac should marry. And so he showers her down with gifts, all right, and asks her for a place to stay. And, and Rebecca immediately runs, and, and it is to be noted here that she runs uh, to her mother, all right? And, and, and we're going to come back to that point in a minute. Now, despite the servant's determination to quickly leave and get back to Abraham, we see that, as a matter of fact, there are a lot of people who have input on this decision. Okay, even though the servant has made it clear, I've come for a, a wife, for Isaac. It is clear that, you know, in order for this to occur, th this Rebecca has to leave where she knows, has to journey and go to this faraway land wherever Isaac is. And, and, and so, uh, my brothers and my sisters, we see that uh, Rebecca gets a say. We see that Rebecca's mother gets a say. We see that Rebecca's brother gets a say. But Rebecca knows exactly what she wants, and she's willing, ready, and able to go. All she really knows is about Abraham's reputation as shared with her by her family who might have decades ago known Abraham, uh, certainly by reputation of what the servant has said, and certainly the gifts that he has presented, but she neither knows Isaac nor knows Abraham. But nevertheless, uh, she is ready to go. She, knew, she knows she has to say goodbye, and she does so in her own time. And she is very decisive when asked if she would go with him. And she says, I will go. And so uh, we see as she makes that statement that she would go, that she also receives a blessing from her family. Similar blessing to what God gave to Abraham in Genesis 22. Now, the reason why Abraham was searching uh, for a wife for Isaac was several things. One, his own wife, Sarah, who would be the matriarch of the family, had died. And, and so Isaac, who was now of age, the second reason, he needed a wife. And this wife would become the matriarch of this family. And, and so th this journey is a long journey between Mesopotamia and Negev. Uh, we're talking about uh, 500 miles or 800 kilometers. Uh, this was something that in those days would not have been a day's journey. We're talking about something that would cover weeks. And, and so uh, Rebecca uh, takes with her attendants, and we, we're not sure what kind of conversation they have along the way in this week's journey. You know, we're not sure if uh, she's talking about, well, what does Isaac look like? What does Isaac like? How is Isaac as a person? What about Abraham? What is he like? We, we're not sure, but I'm sure uh, some of those discussions are uh, carrying on. The attendants probably preparing her for this uh, wonderful meetup. But what we discover is once she gets there, uh, we, Isaac is in the field, and he looks and he sees this beautiful this wonderful caravan approaching and when their eyes beheld each other you want to say it was love at first sight and so uh, they were married and Isaac uh, married Rebecca and Rebecca literally uh, took the role of matriarch in the family uh, from Sarah who had passed away now here was Rebecca taking that vac vacant spot uh, Rebecca is, is, is uh, referred to as the daughter of Bethuel. 
but her father and her father fades into the background of the story. And when we looked at that, it is most likely that he was either sick or already been deceased or perhaps very uh, aged, but he was unable to carry out the patriarchal duty of the family. And so it is notable that Rebecca didn't run to her father's house. Rebecca ran to her mother's household. And, and, and we note that Laban and Bethuel are mentioned, but Laban's name is listed first suggesting that Laban was the one that was making the decisions and calling the shots for the family. Uh, nevertheless, uh, a Rebecca leaves and uh, Rebecca is blessed by them for this journey. Uh, our, our story doesn't actually end here because we actually go through the life of Rebecca and Isaac being married together. And the Bible gives us some accounting. And we see how Rebecca is a strong woman who knows what she wants. And when God reveals to her that uh, her son, I, uh, her son J um, Jacob should be the one that receives the blessing and not Esau, she is very quick to take action even then. Uh, we see certain personal struggles of her. Uh, she doesn't right away have children, but the Lord favors her with children later on, but, uh, and God blesses them. Re Rebecca remains a very strong and decisive woman throughout her lifetime. And when you have a chance, you should read a little bit more about Rebecca and see some of the things that she does. But she definitely rises to the occasion, uh, takes the helm of this uh, uh, family in terms of a matriarch and does what is necessary to ensure that her family is functional and sustained and survives. So we are on page 17 and we're looking at live it. In this narrative, Rebecca was a matriarch in the making. All right. Uh, she, when she was chosen as the wife for Isaac, it was to fill in the gap. And she does so. And she exhibits certain characteristics and she exhibits certain ways that causes her to, her, her to shine forth as a true, strong leader. So let's look at these life application questions on tonight and get a little deeper understanding. Number one, what do you think motivates Rebecca's action in this story? You might find different motives for different actions. So let's look at a couple because there's a lot of actions here. Uh, first action I want to kind of uh, focus in on was she was ready to begin a new life in a new role. And that's clear. You know, we don't know if that syndrome uh, is where there's some children who, you know, I don't care how you tell them, you might live in New Jersey, but they want to go all the way to California to school. All right. They want to be in California. Uh, they want to stay there even after they, they graduate. Okay. Because for some reason they want to be as far away from home as possible. We don't know exactly all of her motives, but she was ready to begin. Her, her statements, her actions shows that she was ready. Uh, it was no lingering thing of wanting to stay around her mother's household. I'm not ready yet. I want to meet Isaac, but you know, I need more time. No, she was ready to go. She was no longer uh, desiring to be the understudy. She now wanted to be the leading lady. And I really want to emphasize this because a lot of people will live in other people's shadows for a long time uh, before they emerge themselves. But she was ready to emerge from behind her mother's household, from behind Laban, uh, from behind her father's household to take this leadership role. And this was a leadership role. Okay, she's not marrying the second son. She's not marrying the third or the fourth son. She's marrying the first son. This carries awesome responsibility. 
Abraham is elderly. Abraham will die at some occasion. And Rebecca will be there with her husband as her husband succeeds Abraham. But she, her role is actually from the moment she starts, she's already in the high matriarchal role. So she's ready to do that. Not only is she ready to do that, but she's also ready for marriage. Uh, when you, when you, when you, and when you look at this, think about it back in then, or even now, or even in times past, when people are looking around, and this one's getting married, and that one's getting married, and this one's getting married, it's only natural for a woman who is that wise-minded to say, well, when is my turn? When is next? She was ready. Uh, she was uh, ready uh, to turn the new chapter and turn the new page. Uh, she, you know, she clearly was prepared for this moment, even though she did not know it was this moment. All right. It, she did not know that someone was going to come from afar looking for her. She did not know that person was coming from a family that was connected to hers. She did not know any of the promises that God had made to Abraham, but she was ready for the marriage. Not only was she ready to begin the new role in life and ready for the marriage, and when I say new role, I'm talking about being matriarch of the family and, and the marriage also coming with that, but she was ready for a new place, a new beginning. And, and not everyone is ready for a new place, a new beginning. Some people would rather stay home for as long as they can, all right? And let's tell the truth and shame the devil, all right? A lot of us have renters who pay no rent living in our houses, right? And so it's not surprising then or now that people, uh, that certain people of the kind of uh, mindset that I'm going to stay home because it's safe. I don't have to make the decisions. You know, the food are provided for me. I don't have to um, figure out where the food is going to come from. Everything is nice, safe, and secure while someone else has to worry and fret. But she was ready. She was ready for her new scenery or new place. She didn't know what she was about to face. She didn't know where the journey would end, but she was ready for something new. And there are people who are always ready uh, for something new. I grew up in this town and I'm done with this town. I'm ready to move on. I want to see another town. All right. She was ready for that moment. I, and not only that, and, and, and like I said, you can find a lot of things in here, but uh, she was climbing the ladder of her success in her time. In her time, there was nothing more successful for a woman from her to marry the eldest son of a wealthy household where she would be the matriarch, not taking second step to the mother-in-law. The mother-in-law was gone. She was the one that had to step up. And so she was literally moving from daughter to the mother, from girl to the woman, from maybe she was second woman, she was third woman, fourth, five, fifth, sixth, any number down the line she was in Laban's household. But here she was in Abraham's household, and she was already number one even while her husband was number two. Second thing, how do Rebecca's words and actions reveal her character? Reflect on how others would describe your character by looking at your words and actions. This is a two-part question, but it's got a lot in it. Uh, number, I'm going to give you four things for the first part, and then we're going to talk about the second part. For the first part, there's a lot you could pull out here. I'm just going to pull out four things, right? Uh, she came to the well with a pitcher. That says a whole lot about her. She could have just came to the well. Why? The well was where you got the news. All right? Where people would come and say, well, let me tell you what's happening in Calney, the town over, okay? This is what's happening. You get that news at the well. Let, let me tell you what's happening in our own town, okay? Let me tell you. Did you know that Mary Sue, uh, you know, she and her husband had an argument last night? What? 
Do you know that they were throwing pots and pans around the tent? What? This, this was the gossiping center. This was the barber shop, if you will, or the hair dressing salon. This was where you went and you got all the news. So she could just came for the news. But the fact that she came with a pitcher on her shoulder meant that she came to work. And she was a worker. And, and, and that says volumes. Uh, she went down and she filled her pitcher at the well. All right, she, she was not willing to just be idle, willing to just sit around, wait around, or be about nothing and do nothing, or procrastinate. She got right to the task at hand. And we can apply that to our own lives in the sense that God values people who work, people who, you know, say enough with the procrastination, I'm going to do the best I can, I'm going to do the best while I can, I'm going to work hard, and we see that she's rewarded because I would imagine in my divine sanctified imagination that some other women came with their pictures, but they still haven't filled it yet. Other women came without their picture, and they're still receiving gossip. But here, Rebecca comes, and she's focused on the task at hand. Not only that, but the second thing I think about is when she was asked, will thou go? And she said, I will. Now, she didn't come with contingencies. She didn't come with, you know, questions. Well, you know, I would come, but let me just ask you a few questions. Okay, so what does Isaac look like? Is he tall, short, fat, skinny, ugly? Uh, you know, what would Abraham, is he a mean, strong man? What, what is he? She, no, I'll, I'm go. She was decisive. She saw the presence. She saw the gifts. She uh, knew of some of the reputation of Abraham from when he was there before. And that was enough for her. I'll go. She was willing. She was ready. She was able. She knew what she wanted to do. Uh, she was definitely a woman that uh, would take charge and make decisions when necessary. And we saw that later on in life. When it came to conspiring to ensure that Jacob received the blessing from Isaac, she was decisive. All right? Jacob didn't know what to do, but the mother was like, come here, son. This is what we're going to do. She already had a plan ready in place because we see this from a young age. We see this from right here, this moment. And so oftentimes we can look into people's character as a child and can see some of their adult tendencies, right? And so we see from a, from a young age that she was decisive. So it's no surprise that throughout her life, she also carries that very character trait. Then uh, the third one we'll look at is uh, she gave him something to drink. And said, and said, drink my Lord. Now, we got to really think about this. He's a stranger. He's not a family member. All right? This is not the usual town crier. You know, this is not John William, the town crier that always comes from Kelna to tell us the news that you would be accustomed with. This is not the local person from the, 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 the town that you're used to. You know, this is Billy John. I grew up with Billy John. I know Billy John. No, this is an absolute stranger. All right. We, she, we don't, she doesn't know his name. All right. We, we don't know much about him. All right. And so here he comes and this stranger and she talks to him. So she's not shy in any way, shape or form. All right. She's not frightened by him. She's not scared of him. All right. Oh, you want something to drink? Here you go. Some women would have been like, oh. <laughs> Some women would have been, I'm sorry, I'm not allowed to talk to strangers. All right? But we see her have a different character. She is kind and entertains a stranger. And this is similar to Abraham. Abraham was kind and entertained strangers. And because he entertained strangers, he received a blessing, which was Isaac, his son. Because it was promised to him. That in his old age, he would receive a son that time next year. And so, 
With that being said, uh, Rebecca exhibits some of the characteristics of Abraham. The fourth thing is, uh, she offers to draw water for the camels too. And so she's hospitable. She's kind. She's a worker. She goes above and beyond the call of duty. This is Rebecca. And so when we look at ourselves, what will others say about us? Are we meanie, meanie? When someone asks us for something, we find an excuse. Yeah, 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 uh, um, yeah, I can't get you any water right now. Maybe you need to ask the other lady over there. Uh, you know, she could help you get some water. Oh, I'm busy right now. I've got, I'm, you know, the reason why I'm here is I'm getting water. And I got to run back to the house, you know, with the water. You know, so maybe one of these other people was sitting by doing nothing. Maybe they can help you out. Okay, see you later. All right. And sometimes we miss our blessing because we're not hospitable. We're not kind. We're always looking for excuses to avoid uh, helping people in need. And as Christians, as children of God, we shouldn't be looking for excuses from helping people. We should be looking for excuses to help people. And here it is that Rebecca shows us what a good Christian ought to do. Even before there was such a thing called Christianity, here she was being a true good Samaritan. She was providing for a stranger. Not only that... All right, but we can also uh, look at other things in our own character. Are we kind? Are we compassionate? Are we willing to help? Are we a worker? What would people say about us? And we have to know how to look into the mirror and, and, and see clearly ourselves. Because a lot of us, uh, unfortunately, sometimes we deceive ourselves into thinking that we are what we are not. The most critical person about us ought to be us. So that we can improve ourselves. If I can be a little better in this department. If I can be a little better in that department. If I can reach high for this. If I can move forward with that. And when people have the conversation about us. It's not that we're concerned with what they have to say. Because sometimes people do say things that are really off center. All right, because they're blinded by their own situation. But when you take an objective look at what you do, objective look at your work, objective look at your characteristics, what shines through? And we should be the ones that look at ourselves and be able to say this shines through or that doesn't shine through. And how can I improve myself? But let's get a little deeper than that. All right. Uh, God challenges us uh, through Jesus Christ's son to, for us to do good works. All right. Not to get into heaven. Not to get a pat on the back. But that others might see our good works and glorify our father which is in heaven. Now think about the first part of Jesus' statement. He said, let your light so shine before men. Right? It's, it's the same characteristics that we're talking about here with Rebecca. Her light shines so much that her actions were seen by another to equate, yes, you are the chosen one. And so when people look at us, they ought to say, yes, you are the child of God. Yes, you are what a good human being and a good person exemplifies. And then you ought to be able to say, it's not me, it's him. To God be all the glory. Great things he has done. All right. We ought to remember that it is the Father who has opened our eyes. That when, uh, that when we are out in the world, we are doing good deeds. And it is the Father that did it through us. And we ought to give back the glory to the Father from whence the goodness came. Remember, there's none good. No not one, only God. And so Rebecca's goodness that God has given her shines through. What about you? Is your goodness shining through? What are real people saying? 
Do they see it? Or are they stumped to try to determine, well, I mean, she goes to church, but, oh, well, she sings in the but, oh, well, she's part of the but. That's, we have to guard our reputation because we are representative of Christ. Let me say this so I can be very clear. We are representatives of our family where we go, right? You know, I, uh, there were two families that grew up on this particular block, right? And I'm just going to call uh, them by pseudonym names uh, so that way I, I don't actually put them on blast. But I'm going to call them the Hatfields and the McCoys, all right? And so, uh, you know, they had a reputation, all right? And the McCoys had a reputation of being troublemakers, and the Hatfields had the reputation of uh, punishing the troublemakers. And they were always at battle with each other. But other families would watch those two families and make comments about those families based on what they saw and what they did. And the question becomes, well, what are, uh, what are people saying about our actions and our character? Are we Hatfields and McCoys? Or are we truly Christians? This third question that uh, comes to us says, "How uh, so do you have women in your life who hold the role of matriarch in your family, church, or community? What, if any, characteristics do they share with Rebecca? I, I, and I'm not going to put pseudonyms on this. I'm going to call out three women. Three women tonight. I'm going to call out my grandmother who's passed, Isabella Cummings, my mother's mother. I'm going to call out a woman who you might as well call her my grandmother, even though she really, there's no blood between us, but Beauty Mae Webster. And I'm going to also call out a third woman. I'm going to... Uh, I say this uh, with clarity. Uh, this woman, uh, all, all these women have passed. Uh, this first woman I call passed before these other two, but Ruth Haynes. And I'm going to call those three names. And I'm going to talk about them because they had certain things in common. Number one, they were strong women. All right. And I'm not talking about just in that wonderful, uh, epicurial way, strong I'm talking about in these ways, strong. All right, I've saw, I've seen these women do what other men uh, would not physically are capable or able to do. I've seen my grandmother go, and, and I've seen her hire uh, the plowers to plow the field, and they plow the field. And I've seen her take her hoe and dig up uh, a whole farmland, and I've seen her sow and plant and reap. Uh, all right, I've seen her uh, pick up heavy buckets of uh, water and, and, and feed and bags of feeding and carry it on her head and her shoulders. I've seen her, uh, you know, do all sorts of very physical labor, all right? I, I, I've seen uh, Beauty Mae Webster. I've seen her be tough and strong, and I've seen her having to uh, move things. I won't say what they were around and do things and she was willing and able to do that i, I i've seen ruth ains you know be a strong and, and and voiceless and powerful leader who who did things that other men sh uh, would would would, sh would literally hide or, or 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 avoid right strong women i've seen them step up after their husband died and did what they needed to do to provide food for their household, to, to, to pay the bills and to run the household and, and, and spend extended time of life without their husband. And yet ensure that they raise children and grandchildren and great grandchildren. I've seen them provide for not just family, but provide for communities. I, I've seen them do this and not complain, not fuss about the fact that they had to do this in order 
for this to be done. I see them as hard workers just on the task, just doing what's necessary, going to work every day, uh, one punching the clock, the other one punching the farm, the other one punching whatever financial situation that they could do, but to ensure that everything was done decent and in order. I watched these women go to church Sunday after Sunday, and, and no matter what the situation was, you could count on them. The roof needs to be, okay, let me, I'm going to contribute. The floor needs to be, let me contribute. Let me pay my tithe. Let me pay my offering. I've seen them do this and not fight for position. I don't need to be the, the head this and the head that. No, I am a worker and a servant. I, I've seen them always entertaining family and friends and even strangers come and you you're hungry here's something to eat you're thirsty here's something to drink I know you here it is I don't know you here it is I've seen them uh, with strong opinions all right strong opinions they 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 definitely knew what they want they knew how to communicate what they want they knew when they wanted it and they knew how they wanted it and they weren't too afraid to say this is what I want I've seen them through all these things I've observed this about these three women I selected they're deeply missed by all who knew them and there are women in your life that exemplify characteristics like Rebecca. And the challenge is to make sure that as you are going through, if you are a woman, that you are putting forth the aura. Like these women I've talked about, Rebecca, Isabella, Beauty. Like these women, that you have put forth that in the atmosphere that they may see your good works but glorify your father which is in heaven these women were strong because they were connected to the father and so it's important that as we are journeying we're connected to the divine heavenly spiritual father number four Rebecca gave up so much to be the matriarch in the family. God chose to use for the redemption of the world. And she did so without knowing the full story. Can you think of a time when you followed God's calling for you without knowing the full story? I'm, going to, I'm just going to be uh, transparent tonight. In saying that all of us should have different experiences, right? But there is one thing we all should share if we are children of God and salvation. When we got saved, we weren't expecting all of this. And if you were, well, then God bless you. But I can speak for myself and say I wasn't expecting all of this. This was my plan, really. I'm going to get saved. I'll, well, I wasn't planning to get saved, but. I'm saying, I'm saved. Glory be to God. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to read the Bible. I'm going to go to church when I need to. And that's it. I'm not going to, get in, I'm not going to be sweeping anyone's church. I'm not going to be cleaning anybody's toilets in the church. I'm not going to be video recording anything. I'm not going to be serving on any deacon board. I'm not going to be uh, with the trustees. I'm not going to serve as a president of anything. I'm just going to come. Invite me to something, I'll come. All right, you'll see me on Sunday. You might see me at Bible study, may or may not. That's my plan. I'm, you know, may or may not. I, I might make guest appearances every now and then. All right, you know, night services. If I'm dragged to, I'll go. But if not, you know, I'll be in my bed sleeping. You know, that's the plan, right? But after we got saved, we realized that the Holy Spirit was calling us to higher service. We couldn't just go to a service. We couldn't just see things needing to be done and not doing something about it. We couldn't just keep it to ourselves. We had to tell somebody about it. We were not planning to do all this. But God happened. And 
Rebecca certainly didn't know all the things that she had to face, but God happened. Do you think that her plan was, okay, I want to marry the man that lives the farthest away from my family. I want to marry a man that lives in a land that is rougher than my family's land. No, she wasn't planning any of that. And we weren't planning for the stuff that happened to us after we got saved. After we got saved, everything changed. We had to deal with all kinds of situations. We weren't planning for, for divorce, but we got rerouted. We weren't planning to be a widow, but we got rerouted. We weren't planning for all this trouble and trials and crisis that we had to overcome. But glory be to God. God prepared us through our salvation journey. And God was with us as we faced every storm. And God got us through every obstacle and so salvation was the beginning of the journey with Christ, but certainly not the end. Not only that, but I can think something that most of you can't think, which is pastorship. Where I wasn't planning for it. I might have been interested in preaching, but not in pastoring. <laughs> and there is a big difference. All right. I wasn't planning for this. This is not my chosen thing. This was not the thing like I told everybody, listen, I'm going to grow up. I'm going to be a pastor. I, I had other things in mind. But God has his own plans. And we as children of God ought to be willing to submit to the plans of God. And God's plans are not your plans. You know, and, and I really got to say this, and this is going to hurt some people's feelings, but I, I'm, I'm going to really say it because it's the truth. A lot of people look at the pastorship and they see the glamour and the glitz. And that's why a lot of people want it. Oh, man, look at that. They're, they're honoring the pastor. Look at that. They, you know, they, they're celebrating his birthday. Look at that and all of this. Yeah, that's the glamour. That's the glitz. <laughs> That's the beautiful, shiny stuff you see. But the reality is work and weariness. You know, and, 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 that I, and I think back when I was not a pastor, and I was watching my pastor, and I said, boy, he sure make pastoring look easy. But in reality of the matter, <laughs> there are more pastors quitting now than any other time in history. And the reason is this is really not for everybody. All right, because you've got to be the one that was sitting in your office and heard someone talk about you and still smile on their face and treat them nicely as a good Christian. You got to be the one that even though they out to get you, you still praying for them and not praying on them. All right, and not praying for God to do something to them. You've got to be the one, even while your own family is being mistreated. And, and, and by the way, let me just put up this disclaimer because I already see it happening. I'm not talking about Second Baptist. But you've got to be the one that's going through all of these hurts, all of these problems, all of these pressures, and yet still smile. And yet still find the word of God for the people that uplifts the people. And, and, and let me say, let me say this, because many people don't realize this, but some pastors aren't able to do that. It's sad, but it's true. Now, here they are preparing this sermon. 19 problems came in. Now they're coming out, preaching the sermon, and they're preaching about the 19 problems that just came in. All right? It's a fact of life, and I'm not speaking negatively of them, because pastors are humans. We are humans. You cut us, we bleed. Contrary to popular belief. But this is not a choice. It's a calling. Right? And what we do in church should be taken as our calling. All right? And if people would understand that, 
they stop getting mad and stop doing what it is that God called them to do. Well, he ain't called my name, so I ain't never going to sweep the church again. You ain't hurting me. You hurting Jesus. Because everything you do, you should do to the glory of God. That's scripture. Oh, you thought I pastored you because of you. No, I pastor you because of Jesus. And I have to give an account to him. And I can't say when he calls me. So, brother, really, Carlo? Yes, pastor? Yeah, yes, Lord? Uh, yeah, I noticed that you uh, mistreated him many times. And uh, you ignored him and didn't say anything to him. Yes, Lord? And, and, and so, why is that? Well, Lord, because... Uh, he mistreated me, and, and he, wait a minute, stop, stop, stop. But the word said, or do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. You see how I can't say it? Aren't you a preacher? Did not call you? Not put the word of God in you? So why aren't you following my words? Why didn't you follow my words? We have to give account to God. So we do it to God. And so, how can we get mad with God? How can we stop doing stuff that we're doing for God? How can we stop giving to God? Once we realize that we're mainly giving our time, our talent, our energy, our money to another steward. But the actual money, time, talent, energy belongs to God. Then we can see things from a whole different perspective. Then we're not mad at the meeting. Well, look what they're doing with my money. Well, you all know you got to give account to God for it. And so it changes our perspective. But not only that, but even in schooling. I mean, it's good to have education. But it's something hard to get. You all with me? Five, Rebecca was decisive throughout her life, but making big decisions often doesn't come easy for most of us. What decisions are you wrestling with right now? And that varies. You could be wrestling with a, a, a marriage, you know, trying to save it. Wrestling with a relationship, trying to keep it, uh, trying to stay together. You, you, you might be dealing with money issues, all right? Don't have enough of it. Should I file bankruptcy? Uh, you know, should I take another job to help pay the bills? You might be wrestling with, you know, uh, uh, with friendship. Uh, should I take a risk uh, with this to, to establish this friendship? Should I keep this friendship? Should I end this friendship? You might be wrestling with, you know, a decision about going back to school or finishing a major assignment or even just as simple as, should I tell the truth or should I lie? But we're all wrestling with something. But brothers and sisters, the main thing is, will our character, like Rebecca, shine forth? Here is our prayer for this evening from page 20. And won't you pray along with me? And this is for all of the women. God of Sarah, Rebecca, and Rachel. God of mothers and those who long to be mothers. God of the outspoken and the silence. God of those who plead, wait, and struggle. Remember your daughters today. Remember those who long for love. Remember your promises to those who carry your image in the world. Remember those to whom you gave a message to share and a part to play in your story. Remember those to whom you gave a voice and sense of purpose. Brothers and sisters, amen. Thank you so much for being attentive tonight. Uh, next week, we're going to deal with the five sisters, amen. And we're going to deal with that in two parts. And so we're going to deal with up to page 24 on next week as we look at the five sisters. Thank you so much for being attentive on tonight. We pray something was said or done that blesses you and we say God bless and good night.